As you might have gathered in your other classes, academics are a bit particular about what we consider to be legitimate information, let alone what we consider valuable knowledge. Even if you're not an academic, the large volume of information available about almost any topic can be overwhelming if you don't have criteria for evaluating the source. In psychology, we evaluate the type of publication, whether it's scholarly or popular. We also consider whether it's empirical or review, which is a little different than being a primary source or secondary. The first distinction we can make is between scholarly and popular sources. They differ in their intended audience, and that, in turn, influences the content and the style of the writing, as well as the credentials of the authors. In psychology, we use scholarly sources. Given that psychology is a science, we also place an emphasis on empirical work, that is, work that reports on the results of a study. In some cases, though, we also see articles that draw on findings from multiple studies to review our knowledge of a topic. Sometimes to simply review it, sometimes to present a theory based on those findings. You may have also heard the primary versus secondary distinction before. The idea is that the primary source is the original source. It's the first time it's shared. A secondary source is one that relays information from that source, so to speak. If you have heard of primary versus secondary sources before, it might have been in the context of history or autobiographies. But in this case, we're referring to the original report of research results. In contrast, a secondary source interprets or reports on those findings. You may have already learned enough about information literacy to make it clear why we care about what types of sources we're using. Even if you haven't, the reason for using scholarly sources might be pretty straightforward. Sometimes, though, it isn't quite as obvious why we care about whether we're reading an empirical source or a primary source. There are at least two reasons those distinctions are important, though. They both relate to steps later in the scientific method, when we write about the topic of our study. When we develop a study in psychology, we typically write a review of previous knowledge to explain the reason for doing that study. When we write that review, we want to make sure we give credit where credit is due and use accurate information. I have a feeling you've noticed all the names and years sprinkled throughout textbooks and journal articles. You might have even heard them called citations. That, in APA style, is how we give credit to the primary source. We'll learn all about all the details for formatting citations in another unit. For now, I just want you to understand that I the idea. Citations help us give credit where credit is due. In other words, they're our way of making sure the original source of an idea receives proper credit. That also means that a sentence with a citation is presenting ideas from someone other than the author who wrote the article. Aside from giving credit, those citations also send a signal that the primary source was interpreted in some way. Paraphrasing is encouraged in psychology. If we're explaining our reasoning, it flows better when we summarize the ideas in our own words instead of quoting directly or reporting. But that creates the possibility of giving the reader the wrong impression when we're paraphrasing someone else's ideas. We could think of it as sort of like being the difference between corn on the cob and cornflakes or taco shells. If we consider the corn itself to be the primary source based on empirical data, the taco shells and the cornflakes are secondary sources, and they're non-empirical. They all, all contain the same underlying data, so to speak, but it's presented in a different form. It wouldn't really be accurate to say that having a bowl of cornflakes is the same as having a bowl of corn. 